Hi, and welcome back to Hazmat Ops Training. This is episode number two in our 2020 Emergency Response Guidebook a full tutorial series. And in this episode, we're going to concentrate on the flowchart, the yellow, blue, and orange pages. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, we're coming to you from Pilot Mountain today. It's a beautiful Saturday morning. I just want to uh, point out some of the nice things about North Carolina. I've told you I'm from North Carolina before, so um, if you're an Andy Griffith Show fan, this is what they call Mount Pilot. It's actually the town is, is Pilot Mountain, uh, so they, they moved some stuff around in the show. Um, really really pretty area it's a state park there if you ever get up this way uh, there's a state park there you can actually walk around it the, the locals call it pilot knob just a quick recap uh, from our overview episode uh, i just want to remind you i want you to look at this uh, book as kind of a toolkit uh, type of a resource where each section uh, builds on the the one previous to it each section leads into the next section they all work together uh, kind of as a package deal toolkit type of a of a uh, setting as a reminder in our overview episode we talked about the safety precautions on page four we talked about protective action specifically evacuations that we can perform as operations level responders and that's one of the biggest things and most important things that we can do to keep the citizens safe. So join me on the inside cover of the book and you'll see here at the, the top of the, the inside cover uh, and, and I'd like to, to also say that uh, the, the publishers of the book put this information on the inside cover for a very specific reason. Uh, they want that to be the very first thing that we see. Remember the emergency response guidebook is primarily oriented for transportation. So we want to keep that in mind as we work through the book. It'll do a lot of things for us for other settings, fixed facility and, and, and those kinds of things, but it's primarily uh, set up for transportation. So having said that, uh, I'll just take my cursor and, and, and highlight a little bit here as we're going. So the first thing we'll look at here is where to find the shipping papers. Generally speaking, the shipping papers are gonna be kept with the crew, whatever that may mean. So for highway transportation, the driver would be the crew. Uh, so th those shipping papers should either be with the driver themselves, actually on them uh, in a pocket in their hand, uh, whatever the case may be, or they'll be in the cab of the vehicle. They could be over the visor, they could be in a door pocket, they could be on a clipboard, uh, you know, under the seat or between the seat. So we need to be um, thinking about where potentially those shipping papers could be if the driver's not with the vehicle. Same thing with, with the train crew. Uh, it'll be with that crew, most likely in the engine area. Uh, we need to look for, again, a, a storage location um, if that, those crew members are not on that power unit. Aviation and Marine, again, kind of in, in keeping with that same theme, it, the shipping paper should be with the crew in that primary crew area. So let's look on down the page and we'll see here the information provided. Uh, those bullets there. We're going to move on past that because we're going to talk about all of those pieces of information in this, right here in the middle of the page, in this example of a hazmat shipping paper. So the first thing that I want to draw your attention to, and I'll highlight this as well, is the emergency contact number. Uh, so this is very important for us on these incidents where we don't have a lot of information, we may be getting conflicting or confusing information. Uh, the emergency response uh, telephone number is something that we potentially could talk to the manufacturer. Um, there's a lot of cases, and I've had this happen in the field, where I've called that, that emergency phone number and actually been able to talk to someone right there at the manufacturer. In some cases, uh, shippers and manufacturers may use a service 
for their emergency uh, contact number, uh, a service like Chemtrack and, and others. Uh, keep that in mind that you, you may or may not be talking directly to the manufacturer, but in a lot of cases that is, that is what will happen and that's, that's extremely uh, helpful to us to be able to talk to someone who it may potentially in the manufacturing process of the material. So uh, we'll talk some more as we go through the book about that emergency contact number and the book does a really good job of reminding us. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about here is the UN ID number, and I'm, I'm highlighting that, circling that with my cursor also. Uh, so the UN four-digit ID number here that we see, it also could be NA, so instead of UN1219, it could say NA1219. For our purposes, that means the exact same thing. So this is the four-digit ID number that we'll talk about a number of times through the book. Uh, that's really the only four-digit number in the hazmat world. Uh, so once we kind of get our mind around what this number is all about, and, and again, we'll talk about it extensively, um, then that's really the only four-digit ID number. There's a lot of other numbers and references for hazardous materials out there in the hazmat world, but for four di the four-digit ID number that we deal with with placards, and for the purposes of this book, this is it. This, this is really the only four-digit ID number that you'll see. The next thing we'll talk about here is the proper shipping name. So those two pieces of information, four-digit ID number, proper shipping name, are the most important thing. And again, that, that will become evident uh, here as we move through the, the flow chart on page one. Uh, so you see the, the proper shipping name here is isopropanol. That also could be stated as isopropyl alcohol. They're, they're synonyms, uh, you could see that either way. Uh, so here again, in this particular illustration uh, for our shipping paper, uh, it's listed as isopropanol. Uh, and we'll see as we go through the book, we'll kind of follow ID number 1219 and proper shipping name isopropanol. We'll follow that as we go so that we kind of stay on track, kind of kind of keep uh, with what we started with. Uh, so you see here, I'm again circling, I've, I've highlighted the number three there. That's our hazard class. There's nine hazard classes. Uh, and potentially some divisions within those hazard classes. This one is hazard class number three, so 1219, and you'll see that that number corresponds with the number in the bottom of the placard. So the hazard class will be in the bottom of the placard. Again, if there's a specific division within those hazard classes, you'll see that expressed as well. So that's what we're talking about with hazard class. Moving across here, packing group is a statement of intensity of the danger. Packing group one uh, materials are higher danger. Um, packing group two would be sort of a moderate danger. And then packing group three, a lower danger. So for us, it's not giving us a lot of extra information, but it is a, a communication of the intensity of the danger. So this is a packing group two, we, and we would understand that as a moderate uh, danger. So moving across here, we see the quantity. So this is the total quantity. So you see that this particular shipment is 12,000 liters of isopropyl alcohol or isopropanol. Uh, and then the next field is number and types of packages. So here we're looking at one tank truck. So for, for what we know as a tanker going down the road, 12,000 liters, it could be expressed in gallons. Uh, so one tank truck for a total quantity of 12,000 liters. This could say, 10 55 gallon drums uh, for a total quantity of 550 gallons or X number of liters, whatever that would translate to. Uh, it could say four totes uh, for a total quantity of whatever that would, would come out to. Uh, so it, again, in this particular illustration, we're looking at one tank truck for a total of 12,000 liters. So again, a really good illustration of, of a, a shipping paper that we potentially could see. So I'll scroll down just a little more here. And we'll look a little bit more in depth here at our placard. And we'll talk about placards as we go and how the book handles placards and helps us to find our way through the book with placards. But again, just real quick here, an illustration for the four digit ID number that potentially could be shown in the placard there uh, and, and actually shown uh, on the placard. Uh, or we could see it out beside the placard on uh, an orange panel like you see here over on the right hand side. 
Uh, again, the hazard class down at the bottom, uh, you'll see a pictogram uh, for the flammable liquid uh, up here at the top. So again, a really good illustration. We'll look at a number of others uh, as we go. Before we leave the inside cover of the book, I, I want to say, uh, and we'll see this as we go through the book a number of times, but I want to draw your attention to, again, why did they put this on the inside cover of the book? If, if, if they could have put a, a flashing sign here, uh, they would have. Um, it's so important that they put it on the inside cover of the book uh, so that it would stand out to us. There's a lot of things in this book that if we understand what we're looking at, um, and if we're familiar with the book and we stay familiar with the book, that things will jump off the page at us. And, and this is one of them. Uh, so getting our hands on the shipping papers is so important that they put that information on the inside cover of the book. And again, as we get to some of those flags, as we get to some of those signs, as we get to some of those things that should jump off the page, I'll, I'll try to, to draw your attention back to those. So join me on page one and you'll see up at the very top how to use this guidebook. So we'll see uh, some really good information right under there. And again, I'm going to highlight this because it is extremely important. And you'll remember, and if you haven't seen our overview episode, be sure to go back and look at that. Uh, but you'll remember from our overview episode that we talked about on page four, the safety precautions. Um, and how good those are, again, to get us started, to keep us on track on just about any incident that we may run up on. Um, but you, you remember seeing, don't, or, or excuse me, you remember seeing resist rushing in. Um, and that's some of the best advice uh, that anyone could get uh, on a hazardous materials incident is don't rush in, don't get in too quick. Don't get yourself in trouble. Approach very systematically, very methodically. Don't rush into this incident. The next thing that you'll see is approach the incident from upwind, uphill, and upstream. So a lot of times as we're approaching, we realize we've got the wind right in our face. Or we were approaching and the, the material is running down the hill toward us. Uh, we, we want to correct that. If that's the case, if we're not able to approach upwind, uphill, upstream, that's a showstopper. That's a timeout. So we want to make sure that we're able to abide by that. If we can't, we may need to adjust our entire thought process, our entire literal approach to the incident. Um, and, and again, time out, back up, let's regroup everything here and make sure that we're approaching the right way to keep ourselves, to keep our, our personnel safe, but also to keep the public safe. And then the, the last thing you'll see here in the bold print underlined there is stay clear of all spills, vapors, fumes, smoke, and potential hazards. Again, really good solid information. Don't get in the product. Stay out of the product at all cost. Uh, again, most folks that are going to be using the emergency response guidebook are operations and potentially awareness level, but most folks out here uh, in our emergency services are operations level responders. Typically, you're going to need to take more of a defensive approach to most everything you do rather than an offensive approach. So again, stay out of the material. We need to stay out of vapors, stay out of liquid spills, solid spills, those kinds of things. Smoke. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've arrived on a scene of a hazardous materials incident and I've, I've asked the incident commander, why are those people standing in the smoke? Why are they standing in, in a visible vapor cloud? Why, why do we do that? So we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're using our noggin, but again, we've got a really good reminder here to make sure that we're, we're not getting tunnel vision, we're not getting overwhelmed by the incident itself, and we're, we're using some good solid common sense. We'll move on down uh, right under uh, the, those, those really good um, safety items. You'll see the warning here with the, the red highlighted uh, warning sign there. It says, do not use the flow chart if more than one hazardous materials or dangerous, dangerous good is involved. Uh, immediately call the emergency response uh, agency a telephone number uh, listed on the inside uh, guidebook. The reason for that is this book doesn't do mixtures very well. 
uh, it's designed for to to kind of look at one material at a time. Um, so when you start mixing hazardous materials, there's really no way for the book to be able to take into account every possible mixture that could take place on every shipment that goes in in all of the countries that that the book is is designed for there's just no way to do that uh, so that's why that warning is there is if you have materials that are mixed together that's another showstopper that's another timeout uh, we need to regroup and make some phone calls call the experts uh, and and get some information about these mixtures uh, and you know still get the the get our hands on the, the information on the shipping papers so that we know what we're dealing with, but the book's not gonna do a very good job of looking at things that are mixed together. So next, we wanna look at the, the flow chart itself. We wanna start down the flow chart itself. And the first box that you see here, and I'm, I'm gonna circle that with my cursor again here. The first box you see there is, and I'll put my cursor out beside of it. Do you see an explosive placard or a label? So we have the option for yes, we do see the explosive placard or label, or no, we don't. So let's assume for a moment that we do see an explosive placard or a label. The reason that explosives are at the top of the flow chart, and the reason that explosives are, are kind of different, and you see we, we've got a different way, a different flow on the chart for explosives than we do everything else, is because of the inherent nature of the way explosives are made. They're inherently mixtures anyway, and they have a very specific and unique set of hazards uh, as well as chemical makeup. So the book handles them differently. The book looks at explosives by way of their hazard, by way of their um, the, the way that they act once they're, they're detonated, those kinds of things. So they group them by hazard. So you, look, you see here for Division 1.1, 1 1.2, 3, and 5, uh, guide number 112 uh, is, is where we're going to go. Uh, for Divisions 1.4 1 and 1 1.6, we're going to go to guide 114. Now we'll look at the guide pages and, and we'll see a little bit more about what those guide pages are all about in a few minutes. Uh, but just understand the reason that the book does this is because it does not look at explosives by the four-digit ID number or by the proper shipping name. So we, we need to just make sure that we, we understand why the book is handling them this way. We'll work on down the page and we see the next box, if the answer to the explosive placard or label is no, the next box that we have here is, do you know the UN or NA ID number? And that's the one that we talked about on our illustration from our, our shipping papers. Uh, so if the question there is yes, then we're gonna go over to the yellow pages. If the answer was no to that question, the next box here is, do you know the name of the material, the proper shipping name of the, of the material? So we're gonna assume here for just a minute, and we're gonna, we're gonna kinda concentrate right here on these four boxes. We're gonna assume that we had one or the other, or, and hopefully both, uh, the, the four-digit ID number and the proper shipping name. So if we have the four-digit ID number, we're gonna go to the yellow pages. So if you would join me on the yellow page, the first page of the yellow, so we're here on page 28, which is the first page of the yellow section. And you'll see here that it talks about entries that are highlighted in green. In this episode, episode two, we're not gonna talk about the green pages. That comes in episode three. So make sure you stay tuned for episode three. Uh, so I wanna move to the bottom of this introductory page for, for section, or for the yellow section. Um, and look at note number two, talks about explosives and basically as a reminder, uh, for what we just talked about with the explosives. The big thing to remember there again, the explosives are not listed by, four, by that four digit ID number. And there's another piece of information here in note number three is that chemical warfare agents are essentially handled the same way as explosives. They're not listed by four digit ID number. They are listed by their, their family name or the chemical family name. And we'll look at that here in just a second. Uh, but explosives and chemical warfare agents not listed by four-digit ID number. So let's move to page 29 and, and look at that just for a second here. And again, the, you see a lot of the green highlighted materials, and we're not going to talk about the green highlighted uh, specifically in this episode. We'll do that in episode three. 
So you'll see several of our explosive materials, a number in both columns here, a number of our chemical warfare agents, and you'll see the obvious lack of four-digit ID numbers. So we've moved a little farther into the yellow pages, and remember we said we were going to follow the four-digit ID number, UN number 1219, which is isopropyl alcohol. Uh, so you'll see here on page 34, ID number, and you see the ID uh, column there, ID number 1219. Uh, the, the column here for our guide pages, which is the orange pages, is guide number 129. And then the proper shipping name is isopropyl alcohol. So you could see also, again, from our illustration on the inside cover, isopropanol and isopropyl alcohol are synonymous. Uh, so you see them, see them listed both ways here. So let's go over to the first page in the blue section. The first page of the blue section, same way, uh, gives us our, our indicator for our green pages. Also the notes for the explosives and the chemical warfare agents. So again, we're going to move on down just a little bit here and look at isopropyl alcohol. So you see here on page 123, isopropyl alcohol listed by proper shipping name in the first column for the blue pages. So it's, it's kind of a, a flip, uh, 1219 listed first in the yellow pages uh, for the four digit ID number and then here in the blue pages the proper shipping name. Same thing for the middle column for our orange pages for guide 129. While we're here, there's a good several illustrations here for guide numbers that have a P behind them. You see several in, in both columns here for guide numbers that have a P. So let's flip back over and we'll talk about these materials and what this means because we have a, a, a kind of one of those flags, one of those signs on the inside uh, cover, or excuse me, on page one uh, in the flow chart. So join me back at the flow chart. So we're back on the flow chart and you see this red dotted line box here. Really, I would like for this to be about right here on the flow chart, but I understand why they put it uh, down below a little bit. It's just something that we need to make sure that we don't overlook. So if we see out beside the guide page uh, on the yellow or the blue section, if we see that the guide number, the orange page that it's sending us to, if we see that P designation, we really need to pay close attention. And you'll see here again, red dotted line box. That's all, that should be kind of like a neon sign for us. It, it should jump off the page at us. So what it says here, if the guide number has a P next to it, the material may suffer a violent polymerization. A violent polymerization is quite simply a runaway reaction. You may have heard the term monomers and polymers, um, they are primarily for the synthetics world uh, made uh, or, or used in the, in the process of, of making plastics for the most part. Um, and these materials in the manufacturing setting or in the laboratory setting, uh, these reactions are, are fairly easy to control. The problem is when these materials become contaminated, their containers become damaged. They Again, they become contaminated with, with something. Um, and, and a lot of times this happens uh, in transportation accidents and, and that kind of thing. So what we don't want this to happen, or, or where we don't want this to happen, is on the side of the road, in the back of a box truck, um, that kind of thing out here on one of our scenes. Again, in the laboratory, in the manufacturing process, the chemists are right there. They can introduce the catalyst for these processes to speed those processes up. They can introduce the inhibitors to slow those processes down. We can't do that on the side of the road. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, and there's really no hazmat responder out there, at least a first responder, maybe some specialists, uh, maybe some contractors that could introduce uh, some inhibitors, but as a first responder, especially as an ops level responder, this is way outside of our scope. We, we can't do that. We don't know how much inhibitor to put in. Does the container even have a place to put it in? There, there's just so many factors uh, that would prohibit us from doing this in the field. The best thing for us to do is to expect these runaway reactions to continue 
and for that container to violently fail. What does violently fail mean? It means explode. So think about the, the ramifications and, and the, 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 the intensity uh, of, of, a, of a rapid, immediate, catastrophic failure of a 55-gallon drum. Think about it from a, you know, a container that may be you know, two or three times that size. And then think about it from a rail car standpoint. So materials out here that, that are undergoing that, that polymerization process, get away from them, get the public away from them, and expect for those to fail. Again, that's why this is a red dotted line box. It should jump off the page at you. So now if you would join me on guide number 129, and you'll see here that that starts on page 194. So guide number 129, again, from the yellow on ID number 1219 or the blue for isopropyl alcohol, uh, we saw both places there uh, that the recommended guide page or the orange in the orange section uh, was guide number 129. So we'll, we're going to run through the, the pieces and parts and the sections of the guides and look at what information they offer us. So right up here at the very top you'll see a general description of the material. Now most of us understand isopropyl alcohol is a flammable liquid, uh, but again if, if, we, if we didn't uh, then we've got a, a general description here. It's a flammable liquid, it's water miscible, meaning that it will, it will mix with water uh, and then it produces noxious fumes that could potentially uh, you know, alter our level of consciousness, that kind of thing, if we inhale those. So that's, that's what that general description is talking about there. So let's look at the first section here uh, on the left-hand side of the page. And, and I'll say before we go down the page here, the left-hand side, this is a two-page guide. You see there, uh, it's, it's both pages uh, for where you have your book open. So the left-hand side, generally speaking, is safety information. Uh, it's oriented for that first responder uh, to really get some information in front of you really, really quickly. And we'll look at some other things that it's designed to do. But just keep in mind, left side safety, the right side is more of your action items uh, and so, some more of kind of the, uh, the, the do's and don'ts on the right hand side, safety on the left. So the potential hazards, uh, again, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the first section here, potential hazards. You see fire and explosion and health. So the, those physical hazards under the fire and explosion, uh, again, general statements um, are, are what you're going to see here because, and the reason I say general statements is because guide number 129 could represent a number of materials. Uh, it could, there could be dozens of materials represented because of the chemical family. It's looking at flammable liquids that are water miscible. There's a lot of those out there. Uh, so again, this, this could represent a number of different materials. So generally speaking, those materials from a fire and explosion standpoint, physical uh, hazard standpoint, uh, highly flammable. Uh, the vapors may form explosive mixtures. You, you see working your way down here, there's a good reminder about the polymerization hazard. Uh, again, just some, some really good general guidance. And then on the health uh, subsection under potential hazards, you see here from a toxicity and an exposure standpoint, uh, it's giving you some guidance there, some warning information there. So before we leave the potential hazard section, I want to go over one thing. Hold your finger on guide number 129 and flip over with me to 131. Okay. So we see here on page 198, the first page of, of guide number 131. You see but basically the same thing, flammable liquids. These are, are toxic uh, in the general description up there. So same, same layout, potential hazard section. But you see here that health, un, under guide 131, health is listed first, fire and explosion is listed second. That's backwards from guide 129. Why is that? Again, this is another one of those things that should jump off the page at you. Again, let's look at our general description up here. Flammable liquids, and instead of water miscible, it says toxic. Okay, That's the first flag. That should be the first thing to jump off the page at you. And then the next thing here is the fact that the health, the exposure information, the toxicity information is listed first. 
Okay, so here's the rationale. Guide number 131 also represents a number of different materials, potentially dozens of materials. These materials are also, just like the ones represented on 129, they're flammable liquids as well. But these group, this group of materials, these are much, much more toxic as a general statement than the ones represented over on guide 129. Hence the reason that the toxicity information is listed first. These two things should jump off the page at us. A very, very important. Uh, they want us to see that toxicity information first. So let's go back to guide 129. I want to kind of stay in the same theme, stay with the same material. I just wanted to show you that little bit of a difference there. All right, so we're gonna, let's work our way down the page a little bit more here to the public safety section. There again, left-hand side of the guide, uh, there on 194 for guide number 129. You'll see here, uh, and again, this information, I'll slide down just a little bit. You'll see this information here. This little section, this little box here, the first uh, subsection of, of public safety is for the first, specifically for the first responders. Uh, for the folks that are getting there first, again, reminder for the upwind, uphill, uh, upstream reminder, keep people out, th those kinds of statements, really good solid information. Reminder here for get your hands on the shipping papers, call the emergency response phone number uh, if that's something that you need to do. Again, good solid reminders. This should jump off the page at us. Uh, the, so the subsection here that we see for protective clothing, uh, you'll see some additional information for protective clothing on page 360 and 361. Uh, generally what you'll see here is wear an SCBA, and structural firefighting gear has limited protective measures or limited protective capability. You'll almost always see that on every single guide. So for some additional information, 360 and 361 for protective clothing potentially could help you out a little bit more uh, for some specific guidance on protective clothing. Let's move down to the evacuation section. You'll see here, uh, this is the first place where the book, under that immediate precautionary measure, this is the first place where the book talks about evacuation distances. And I'm going to put this uh, on, on the middle of the screen as I'm talking about it. Uh, but you'll see here, remember we're talking about a liquid material. Uh, so 150 feet in all directions. For the purposes of this book, 150 feet in all directions for just about any liquid material that we're talking about when dealing with this book, 150 feet is standard. So there's three distances that are standard for solids, liquids, and gases. For solid materials, 75 feet. For liquid materials, 150 feet. And for gas materials, 330 feet. So if you can commit those to memory, before you ever get your book off the truck, out of the console of the car, whatever the case may be, wherever you keep your book on the rig, before you ever put your hands on the book, we know if we've got a solid material, immediate isolation 75 feet. If we're dealing with a liquid material, immediate isolation 150 feet in all directions. Gas material, 330 feet in all directions. We can commit that to memory. We can start making that happen before we ever get the book off the, the, the rig and start with some of our other information that we, we will have to look up. There's no way to commit that to memory. But if we can commit the 75, 150, 330 solid liquid gas, we've got an evacuation or at least that immediate isolation distance that we can come off the truck, come out of the car, whatever your situation is, whether you're law enforcement, fire, EMS, whatever. As we come off the rig, we've got some distances that we know are tried and true. They're, they're right there in the book. It's published. It's been that way for a number of years. So that's some things, again, just a little bit of, of, of committing to memory that we can help ourselves out. In the previous, if, if you're familiar with the previous revisions of the book, this information used to be up here in the top. They moved it down so that all the evacuation distances together. That was, a, that was a really good move because that was a little bit confusing. They've got it all together in the 2020 edition. I really like that. I think it was a great move. 
You'll see here the second consideration for large spills, and we'll talk about the, the, the threshold uh, in, the, uh, in the episode three for, for the green pages, but quickly, for liquid materials, the 55 gallon drum is, is kind of the, the, the split, it's, it's the delineation between large and small. So for liquids, anything 55 gallons or less is considered a small spill. Anything greater than 55 gallons for liquids now uh, is considered a large spill. So if we're, if we're dealing with a large spill, um, then there's some extra considerations, a little bit greater distance uh, that, we've, that we've got here. Uh, some, again, some really good solid information for us really quickly, really early uh, in, in the process of using the book. Also, a fire consideration here for large containers. It specifically talks about tanks, rail cars, tank trucks, those kinds of things. Where there's some additional information there. Uh, so you see a half mile in all directions of immediately isolating uh, and then downwind uh, consideration of an, an additional half mile. So uh, really, really good solid information for those, those larger containers. Again, here's the rationale behind that. If those containers are involved with fire, there's a high likelihood they're going to fail. Uh, and they could fail in what's called a blevy, boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion, or they could, they could have um, a, a violent failure uh, in any number of ways. Again, it could be polymerization. There could be a number of different reasons. Uh, but again, the, the consideration here is large containers involved with fire expect them to fail. That's why you see that distance is so much greater. So let's move over to the right hand side of the guide page to the emergency response section. And you'll see here some specific guidance uh, in addition to the evacuation information we saw on the left hand side, you see some specific guidance for fire considerations. Again, this is going to be general guidance because we're dealing with guide number 129 could be representing a number of different materials. They should all basically act the same. Uh, but there will be some differences um, from one material to the other, even in the same chemical family. There'll be very slight differences. Uh, but the, again, some general guidance on a lot of times what you'll see on these on the fire section on any any guide page is some of the materials for extinguishment to use and some extinguishing agents not to use. Um, so again, some considerations for large fires, um, small fires, uh, and also for uh, different types of containers, specifically uh, tanks and larger transportation containers here. Uh, again, just keep in mind, it's, it's general information. Spill and leak, uh, we're going to do some specific uh, episodes on spill and leak control. Uh, but again, some general guidance, uh, you know, keep it out of waterways, keep it out of stormwater conduits, uh, you know, attempt to, uh, you know, stay out, stay out of the product, of course, but attempt to, uh, you know, prevent entry into, you know, onto soils and those kinds of things. Uh, so, some general guidance here for spill and leak. Additionally, on page 362 through 364, you'll see some additional guidance for spill and leak control uh, if, if you're looking for some additional information. Moving on down the page, uh, we see uh, in addition to our toxicity information on the left hand side, uh, you'll see some first aid. So we've got some guidance here if we have someone who has been exposed to the material, potentially contaminated by the material, created some sort of injury, uh, and there's some guidance here for decontamination as well. Uh, in the back of the book, there's some, some extra guidance and extra information for, for decon also. The big thing with exposure uh, is we want at all costs, we want to get the contaminated clothing off the victim. Uh, so that's a, another thing to keep in mind as we look through some of our first aid and the guidance for, for uh, decontamination. The, the book does a really good job at, at making that suggestion, but I want to reinforce that. We really need to get the contaminated clothing off the victim. Studies have shown that up to 90% 
of the contamination can be removed from someone, from their body, simply by removing the contaminated clothing. So we want to try to get that done at all costs and then take extra decontamination measures, copious amounts of water, flushing the skin, eyes, whatever may be contaminated. So now we understand how to take the four digit ID number, the proper shipping name, look those up in the yellow or the blue pages, find our guide page and get some really good solid information. However, and, and again, I, I would, would ask you to, to join me on the flow chart again here on page one. There's times when we won't have the four digit ID number or the proper shipping name. So sometimes that's just gonna be the case. We won't be able to find it. We won't be able to find the driver, the conductor, whatever the case may be, um, the, the vehicle, uh, the train, whatever the situation is, could be damaged uh, beyond the point where we can retrieve our shipping papers. Uh, so there's times when we're gonna have to rely on other measures. That's not what we wanna do. We want the four digit ID number and the proper shipping name. We're the most successful with this book with the four digit ID number and a proper shipping name. But if we can't get it, we can't get it. And so we, we have to resort to other measures. So let's look back at the, the flow chart here. So if the answer to the four digit ID number, no, we don't have it, we can't find the shipping papers, don't have the proper shipping name. So the next thing is, do you see a placard or a label, yes or no? Uh, if the answer to that is no, do you see a rail car or a road trailer? So we're gonna look at both of these kind of at the same time here. Uh, so if we have to resort to placards and labels, um, and that may be on the side of a tank, uh, a road tank, it may be on the side of uh, you know, a container uh, on a ship, it could be a number of different things. It could be on a smaller box where we're looking at a, at a small label, not a, not a 12 inch um, placard, but maybe a smaller label. Uh, the book is, is helpful uh, with that, even though that may not be a transportation setting, the book is still, is still useful there. Um, or we may be looking at the shape of a container. So a highway or a rail uh, container shape may be the way that we have to do that. Again, the, the book doesn't like that. The book likes four digit ID number, proper shipping name, but it, it is helpful. It is gonna give us some information. So let's go to page eight. We'll look at the placard and labels first. And then after that, we'll move right over to 10 through 14 uh, when we're looking at our highway and rail. So we're here on page eight and we're gonna kind of stay again, we're gonna stay with the 1219 isopropyl alcohol um, hazard class number three. We're gonna stay kind of on this on the same theme that we've been on. Uh, so you see here, this is the the placard that we saw on the inside cover of, book, of the book, um, our, our example uh, earlier uh, in the episode. Uh, so this is the, the placard that we would have seen. Uh, so if the, the product wasn't being transported in sufficient quantities, that it had to have the four digit ID number stamped on the placard, we may simply only see this placard here. And you see a number of other examples of placards uh, for some things that we've already referenced here on page eight and nine. So you see here that this gives us guide number 127. So for, for all of these, the, the black dot there with the three digit number, that's our orange page number uh, for matching up our placard that we see to this page eight and nine, or this, this section here on page eight and nine, um, it, it's given us a guide page to go to. That's not the one we went to, remember. So for isopropyl alcohol, we were, we were sent to guide number 129. The reason for that is, remember, we're generalizing here. We're not looking at this by four digit ID number or proper shipping name, we're generalizing. So the book has no other choice but to group them all together and put them in a more general sense. Typically, you'll see more of a worst case scenario uh, type of, a, of an approach to this, uh, but the fact remains is we're not on the exact guide page where we belong. We're on a more general guide page. So at some point, we would really like to have that four digit ID number or proper shipping name. Sometimes it's just not gonna happen. We're just not gonna be able to get that. Uh, so again, in, in lieu of that, that's why we get a more generalized approach. So let's look at page 10 through 14. 
Uh, the same thing applies here with the container shape matching. So in, in placards and labels, we're matching up that placard. We're comparing it against eight and nine. Here on page 10 through 14, we're looking at that container out there on the rail, out there on the highway, on the side of the road, uh, whatever the case is, and we're matching that with uh, page 10 through 14 here. So you see on the rail car, uh, there's a number of different things, and I want to want to point this out quickly. There's a number of different things that could could be carried in each one of these rail cars. So as you look the, here on uh, the, the next few pages for rail cars, keep in mind there's a number of things, and and you've got some examples over here of the things that can be carried in these cars. Uh, so again, there's a sort of a generalized approach here for guide number 117, uh, there could be a number of guides that we would potentially go to if we had the four digit ID number and proper shipping name for what's being carried in that car. But if we can't find that information, again, we're gonna get a more generalized. So you see here an example of a pressure car. Um, there's some, again, there's some guidance over here and some description on what you're looking at. So for this one here, uh, if you think you're looking at a pressure car, you're gonna see a single housing up top, no valves on the bottom, and it tells you that. So it's protective housing, no bottom fittings. That's a, that's a dead giveaway that we're talking about a pressure container here. And again, we're looking at the, the materials up here in the top bullet of what potentially could be carried in that car. As we move on down, you'll see some additional uh, examples of different cars. This is a non-pressure, this is kind of the workhorse of the tank car industry, the non-pressure or the low pressure car. Again, 131 represents a number of different materials. Uh, it's more of a generalized approach. So uh, just, we wanna make sure that you, that you understand that. So we'll, we'll keep kind of working our way down here. I wanna point out before we leave rail cars, there's a, a marking system uh, example here on the bottom of page 11 that's, that's very important to us. In addition to that emergency response telephone number on the shipping paper, uh, we may also be able to give those folks the, the reference number here, the stencil uh, off of the side of the rail car uh, and, and be able to cross-reference uh, against that number uh, for especially for the carrier, the rail company, there's a number of online resources where we may be able to look that up as well. Uh, so there, there's some really good information in the stenciling here. Uh, you'll see some weight uh, limits. You'll see some test pressures. You'll see the safety valve uh, operating pressure. Uh, there's just a number of things and a lot of good information that we may be able to get uh, from the stenciling there on the side of the car. So the highway trailer uh, identification chart uh, starting here on page 12. Uh, so basically the same as what we had with the rail containers. Uh, again, we're just matching up the shape of the container uh, and then we'll, we'll get a, a generalized guide. Uh, again, some pressures over here, some examples of materials that could be carried in those containers. Uh, so we've got a lot of good information here. Um, but again, we would much rather be approaching this from a four-digit ID number, proper shipping name. Uh, this is a good example here. Um, the elliptical shape of the DOT 406. Uh, this is the workhorse of the petroleum industry. And again, you've got some examples over here. Uh, this one can carry gasoline, diesel fuel, aviation fuel. It can carry a lot of different things. Um, and you, this is the one you see going down the highway, uh, probably more than any other tanker uh, out there on the road, because again, it is the workhorse of the petroleum industry running back and forth to our gas stations from our tank farms and refineries and that kind of thing. Uh, you'll see the maximum allowable working pressure for each one of these. Uh, so that gives you some good idea of what kind of pressures you're dealing with. Uh, and again, you, some, some of the things to look for, does it have bottom outlet valves? Uh, those kinds of things, uh, and so you can see it obviously does here. Again, the book does a really good job of kind of guiding you along, giving you some things to look at. And as we scroll on down uh, through the, the remainder of the, the road trailer section here, you see a number of different examples. 
the book does a really good job of giving us uh, those, those examples. I'll draw your attention to the mixed cargo, and you see that this is a, this is a box trailer or what in the, the, the highway and the trucking industry is known as a dry van, uh, so the one I'm circling here. Uh, you see guide number 111 is what it recommends for that particular one. So think about what can be carried on this box trailer anything and everything. Um, if it'll go in a drum, if it'll go in a tote, if you can strap it to a pallet, if you can roll it on there with a pallet jack or a hand truck, you can ship it on that, on that, uh, in, in that particular uh, trailer. So we need to understand for mixed cargo, for anything and everything, Guide 111 is kind of our go-to. So we're gonna wrap up with what is, what's the deal with Guide 111. So join me back on the, the flow chart on page one. So again, for those situations where the answer for, for the four-digit ID number, no, I don't have it. Proper shipping name, no, I don't have it. Do you see a placard or a label? No, I can't find a placard or a label. Um, and for some reason, um, I, I, I can't get a good visual on a rail car or a, a highway container shape. But I know something's wrong. I know I've got a hazardous materials incident. I know I've got something that I've got to deal with. Uh, so guide 111 is a really good, in, in, in combination also with the safety precautions on page four, that's a really good generic guide for just about anything that you'll run up on. Um, it's not specific to anything, but it is generic to everything. So again, along with those safety precautions, it's a really good uh, guide for, for what we're trying to do is we're just trying to get some information. Um, anything is better than nothing when, we, when we're just grasping for information and we just don't have much available to us. So before we leave the flow chart, uh, and again, I'll remind you to, to join us on uh, episode three for the, the green pages. But before we leave the flow chart, I want to point you to this black dotted line box here. And basically what that's saying is, is if all of those answers are no, uh, or we had to, to go placards and labels and container shape, uh, it, you had to go that route. Um, basically what this is saying is if you get good information, if you get that four digit ID number or proper shipping name somewhere in the process, just redo the flow chart. Just run it again. Um, you know, don't don't let that throw you. Don't don't let it you know uh, instill panic into your into your process. Just go back and run the flow chart again. If you get extra information, let the flow chart work for you. Run it again. We're glad you could join us uh, again. Remember to put any questions you have down in the the comment section. Uh, remember to subscribe uh, so that you'll get the content. Click the notification button so that you'll get notifications when we post new content. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining us again. Remember, this is a multi-episode series, so we want to make sure uh, that you get them all uh, so that this is, again, this is a, a, a kind of a package deal for you. Um, we enjoyed you being here. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.